All right, welcome back everyone. Today we're gonna to be taking an introductory look at light. So before you, you have a value scale. Uh, you've probably seen something like this before. On the top, we have a gradient value scale that moves smoothly from each step of lighter to slowly darker on the right side. And on the bottom, you have um, a nine step value scale. There are obviously steps of medium grays in between each of these divided sections on the bottom. Um, but this is just a simple way of looking at the range of light from white to black. Now I'm gonna flip this for you and we'll be looking at the value scale in this orientation for the rest of the time because I want you to think about the value scale um, in terms of a piano keyboard. For those of you who may be familiar with a piano, this might help um, to illustrate what we're talking about a little bit. So that there are groups or regions of this value scale. So if we look at the left-hand side, we might say that this is the low end of the value scale, uh, much the same way that on a keyboard, the bass notes are on the left end. In the middle, you have the middle value scale and on the right, you have the high value scale, um, moving from white into very light gray. So pretty simple concept there, but we're going to look at ways of grouping um, these sets of low, middle, and high values into an organizational scheme that will help us to understand and look at different kinds of images. So back to our value scale here. And what I wanna talk about are major value keys. So in the same way that on a piano you have keys, right? You might be in the key of C or in the key of G, etc. right? There are keys to images, um, they're value keys. And within this full spectrum from blackest black to whitest white and all of the grays in between, if we use the whole expanse of that spectrum, or if we use most of the expanse of that spectrum, we might say that we're working within a major value key. Um, so if you think of major chords on a piano or a guitar or anything, um, they're bright, happier, right? So if you use mostly dark tones, but still use some of the lighter tones as well, and maybe even use a pure white. But most of the composition is made up of dark, low-end tones. Then you might say that you're using a low major value key. So similarly, if you use mostly middle range tones, but still use some very darks and some very lights, a small expanse of those, right? Most of your composition is made up of middle values, then you might say that your image is working in a middle major value key. And similarly, if you use mostly light tones in your image, in your design, and you also use some of the darker values, possibly even a small amount of black in there, then you might say that you're using a high major value key. So since there's major value keys, then there must also be minor value keys. And let's look at how that works. In a minor value key system, you're going to reduce the amount of tones that you are allowing yourself to use. So this is a kind of delimitation again, right? This is a barrier that you might set up for yourself as a problem. This entire discussion of design from the perspective of looking at problems to solve. This is how you really want to look at solving a visual issue that you might be having by setting up for yourself, by establishing guidelines saying, I can't do this, but I can do this. And I can't do that, but I can do this. So in minor value keys, you're limiting the range of tones that you're going to use. So if I want to create a low minor value key, then I might use only this end of the spectrum here, from darkest dark to about middle gray. If I wanted to use a middle minor value key, 
then I might use my middle gray and a couple of steps in either direction towards darker and towards light. But I'm not going to use the full range. I'm not going to use my blackest black and I'm not going to use my widest white. And again, if I want to create a high minor value key, then I might use mostly white and go just a few steps to the left of that uh, towards the middle gray, but I won't use my blackest black for sure. And I'm going to demonstrate for you um, by showing you examples of artwork here, um, how this can shift the feeling, the tenor of an image, how these value keys really work on you perceptually and how they affect you psychologically. So but before we do that, we need to introduce this idea of color. Um, I've been trying to steer us away from looking at so much color um, throughout the semester and, and looking more at um, images that can be understood in a grayscale, very simply. Um, but at this point, you're starting to learn about tone and value. You're, we've got to get into a discussion of color, at least in its relationship to value. So this is an image from Johannes Itten's The Art of Color, uh, which is a very good book on the mechanics of color and how they work in design. Um, and you might be using it next semester in design too. You'll certainly be using this scale here. So along the left-hand side, you have a value scale from light to dark. Now this is a reproduction and it's important to, to point out here that anytime that there's a reproduction of something, a photograph taken of the actual object, the photograph, the camera, is going to blow out the contrast of things, even if you reduce the contrast when you're taking the photo, so that light colors, light tones appear lighter than they actually are, and dark tones appear darker than they actually are. Uh, and as a result, you can see on this left-hand side that the value scale is not really perfect. It's not the darkest dark at the bottom, and it's not the lightest light at the top. Um, this is a result of the way that reproduction changes um, the image. Um, and that's also an important thing to keep in mind in general when you're looking at reproductions on a computer screen, in a book, anytime. Um, those colors are not true to life. The only way that you're really going to experience these things is to see them in person, um, which is why right now, you know, um, with coronavirus and everything, it's, it's making things a little bit more difficult for our purposes, but also, you know, for going to things like museums. I know that Hattiesburg doesn't exactly have access to a lot of that, um, but there is up in Laurel, uh, Mississippi, the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art, which is a really, it's, it's a little gem of a place um, to go look at art. Um, and it's really amazing that Mississippi actually has that. Anyway, I'm getting off track here a little bit. Um, what I want to talk about here when looking at this chart is the way that colors have intrinsic values to them. So when we add white to a color, we call that a tint. And, we add, and when we add black to a color, we call that a shade. Where the color is at its highest saturation, it doesn't have any white added to it, to it and it doesn't have any black added to it, it doesn't have any other color except for itself, that highest level of saturation for that color is going to have an intrinsic value. For example, down here, blues and purples have their highest intensity, their highest saturation, on the low end of the value scale. When we move into blue greens and greens, we'll find that their highest level of saturation exists somewhere along the middle of the value scale. If we look at green yellows, yellows, and yellow oranges, we can see that their highest level of saturation is very high on the value scale so that yellow is an intrinsically light color, right? Purple is an intrinsically dark color. That doesn't mean that you can't have dark yellows, and it doesn't mean that you can't have light purples. But again, where they're at their highest level of saturation, their purest form, is somewhere laying along this value scale on the left-hand side here. So moving along, reds, 
will have their highest level of saturation somewhere in the middle of the value scale. And moving back into um, magentas and purples again, we can see that their highest level of saturation is going to be, again, at the low end of the value scale. Okay. So colors at their highest intensity have intrinsic values. That's important to know going forward because we're gonna be looking at um, paintings um, and I'm going to be desaturating those paintings so that you'll be able to see the tone relationship better. Um, but first we're gonna be looking at them in full color. So this is an example of a high major value key in this um, watercolor painting by Walter Anderson. Walter Anderson is a Mississippi native. Um, there's the Walter Anderson Museum, either down in Biloxi or Gulfport. You should go check it out. He's really an amazing artist um, working from nature here, a stylized, abstracted nature. We can talk about the repetition of shape throughout here, the contrast of different sorts of shapes and everything. Um, but I want us to see that this is a high major value key. It is mostly created of light values, although there are some darker end values in there. There's some dark purples, some dark blues, and the shade on the, um, on the tree branches there. So let's desaturate this image and look at the way that it works just as tone. So you can see here, again, it's made up largely of very light colors, although there are some darker tones in there as well. So it uses the full range of the value of the value scale, but it uses mostly the high end. So here's another example of a high major value key image, this time by uh, the painter Elizabeth Payton. She's a contemporary artist. She makes a lot of these portraits here. Um, so here's this in full color and we'll desaturate it again and see that, yes, most of the image is composed of very light tones, although there are some darker tones in there as well. But the majority of the area of the composition is high tone. So this is a high major value key. So let's look at another work by Elizabeth Payton and see how she can use a high minor value key as well. This is a self-portrait by Elizabeth Payton and the range in tones has been compressed here. She doesn't use a darkest dark uh, and she uses mostly very, very light soft colors here. Let's desaturate it and see that yes, this is a high minor value key image. So there's a difference here in the feeling between this image, it's, it's a very similar subject matter to the last image that we looked at, uh, a head portrait. Um, but by shifting the relationship of the values in the image, she's given a different weight, a different feeling to the image here. And another example of a high minor value key painting, uh, this one by Kazimir Malevich, um, and this is about as minor of a key as you can get in terms of in terms of the value system here. So if we talk about uh, major value keys using a full range of tones, uh, and we think about um, major keys uh, in music, right? They're happier, they're more lively, and in a similar way, there's more contrast, more liveliness to the images. In a minor value key system, similar to music, it's, it's more somber. It's, uh, it's a more serious sort of image because it's so subdued that it takes time to look at it and see what's actually there. I don't actually need to desaturate this image, but I'm going to anyway. And there you can see it's not much different there in, in the desaturated version of the image. Very high value tones used across it, a very, very limited range in those tones. So it's a minor value key. All right, let's move on to middle. So here's a middle major value key painting by Jules de Ballancourt, who's another contemporary painter. Um, and we'll take this image and we'll desaturate it. 
and see that it is made up mostly of middle value range tones, although it does have some light lights and it does have some dark darks as well. Another example of a middle major value key is this painting by David Hockney. And we can see again that when we desaturate it, that yes, there is some dark darks, perhaps that piano in the back or the dog uh, in the bottom left corner, but there are also some very light lights in the top along the ceiling there of the room. But mostly across the board, the image is composed of middle values. Okay, so that has this type of feeling to it from the contrast and this major feeling. Now let's move on to another kind of interior in the minor key. This is a painting by Edward Bouillard, uh, an impressionist painter. And there are some darker spots, there are some lighter spots, but mostly across the board, especially when we look at this desaturated, you can see that the tone, right, the light, moves all the way across the image, a very minor shift in tonality from one extreme to the other. It, it doesn't allow for dark, dark, darks, and it doesn't allow for light, light, lights. Most of it is composed of this middle gray moving all the way across it. And let's look at that saturated again and see how that differs there from the desaturated version here. Let's move on to another middle minor value key painting. Uh, this is Chris Ophelia's The Holy Virgin Mary. Chris Ophelia is a contemporary artist. Um, this painting is was quite controversial when it was first shown. Um, if you'll zoom in on those butterfly shapes surrounding uh, this image of the this icon of the Virgin, uh, you'll find that those aren't butterflies. Um, and her right breast, which is exposed, and the two balls that um, support the image that say Virgin Mary on it, um, those are actually polished, highly polished um, balls of cow dung, is what they are. So, pretty controversial painting, but it's an important one um, for contemporary art. And look, let's look at it uh, desaturated. You'll see that across the image, the light moves across the image from the negative space into the positive form very cleanly. There are some darker areas, there are some lighter areas, but the range is very subdued. There are no dark darks and light lights here. It's a very minor value um, painting and that's important for the subject matter. Um, the Virgin Mary, right, is this, um, this religious persona who is meant to be, um, right, revered and look, looked up to. Um, and so by creating this painting in a minor value key system, Ophelia is slowing down your engagement with it. He's asking you to take a longer look at it, to slow down and to um, give it the proper respect that it deserves. So again, there's this difference in the feeling between a major value key and a minor value key. So let's move on then to the low major value key. Okay, here is an engraving by Rembrandt van Rijn. You know Rembrandt, he's a big deal. Um, this is an image of the three crosses. Right? We just looked at another religious image. So here is a continuation of that in the iconography of Christianity here. So you have Christ in the center of the two thieves who are also on crosses there. This is a very literal illustration uh, from the gospel, this idea of the world turning dark and the sky splitting open when uh, Christ is crucified and dies and um, the light of God here descending from heaven uh, onto Jesus. Now. I'm showing you this image for a very particular reason. You guys throughout the semester have been doing thumbnails. You select your best thumbnail and you create variations from that and you select your best, best variation and then you give me a final design. 
it's important to get in that mode of working, to work through multiples, uh, multiple iterations in a quick way um, before you arrive at your final image that you want to show, um, whether you're a painter or a designer or a sculptor or whatever you're working on that's visual, you want to work through multiple iterations of it to get at the essence of what the image is that you're working on. So here is Rembrandt, um, veritable master, right, in visual communication, well known across the, the world at this point. And even he is doing variations. So what he's doing here, this is um, a type of engraving called a dry point where he is scratching the surface of a metal plate, you ink it up and you take an impression from the plate. Um, because it's dry point, that means that over time, as you take impressions from the plate, the plate wears down. And so what he's doing then is he's changing the plate and there are five known um, states of this engraving, of this dry point engraving by Rembrandt. So we're gonna look at five different iterations of the same idea. These are his variations uh, on a theme. Um, some of them are slight. So if we go from, this is the first state that we have of the print. If we go from this to the second state here. Now there's gonna be some difference in color because of the paper that it was printed on, but you can see that he's gone very dark, um, right? He's darkened up the, the space behind Christ. He's darkened the figures, especially along the left-hand side. Let's look again at the first version here and we go into the second state. Things have become darker um, and we'll move into now the third state, and you'll see that he's going to lighten some things back up and he's going to bring some faces out in this crowd in the bottom um, left-hand corner here. And I want you to pay attention to where these knights are. So below Christ to the left, there are these mounted knights and they have these spears. Um, and also to the far left, uh, even to the left of the thief on the cross there as well, um, that he is sitting there on the horse and he has this spear and there's this flag that he's holding. And I want you to note the difference here. Again, this is a low major value key. Most of the images created um, the very dark world. There's light also in it, um, but overall it's, it's, it's very dark. And let's move into the fourth state, completely different. Let's look at that again. Look at where the mounted knights are again, and you can see that he's gonna radically shift their position. He's gonna move one of these horses completely 180 degrees facing the other direction. He's gonna eliminate figures. He's going to get rid of everything that's distracting from the image, boom. And now we can say that this is a low minor value key. We still have this idea of the dark world, right? The sky growing dark and the earth growing dark and this light of God shining down on Christ. But the range from light to dark has been subdued. It doesn't have the lightest lights possible, but it has a lot of dark areas. And he's gotten rid of um, several figures, especially in the um, bottom left corner and in the bottom center, they're gone. Um, the person who is hanging on the cross on the right is now totally cast in shadow. You can't see them at all. And this is the final version that he landed on. Um, now there's a fifth state of this, but the only difference there is that um, somebody gained access to this, to the plate that he was pulling the prints from and the publisher of the new prints put their address if you can believe that, on the bottom um, of the image. So I don't have a, an image of the fifth state of this print, but there's no difference in terms of the design from this one to the, the fifth state. So if the masters have to do this, if they have to rework images, I can guarantee that you're gonna have to do the same thing. So moving on, let's look at another low major value key painting. Um, and this is a painting by Kerry James Marshall. Across the image, light moves 
very dark light moves across it. There is this spotlight um, on this woman in bed and that creates this high contrast between very light lights and very dark darks. Um, and so there's a full range or nearly at least a full range um, from the darkest dark to the lightest light. Um, and this creates one sort of feeling. Now we're gonna look at another painting by Carrie James Marshall in a low minor value key and see how the, the use of subdued value keys can totally shift the feeling of a painting. It's the interior of a, um, of a bedroom again, but it's gonna to feel totally different. There's the desaturated version of that painting. So what this painting is, it's a painting of the bedroom of Fred Hampton. So Fred Hampton was the chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. And in December 1969, um, the Chicago Police Department and the FBI conducted a pre-dawn raid and uh, killed him in his bedroom. So this is a painting of his bedroom before that happened. You can see in the top right corner, there's actually the Black Panther flag there. Uh, I've seen this painting in person. It's huge is one thing. Um, and that affects you psychologically in, in this way. It fills the periphery of your vision. It is the only thing that you can see. You have to pay attention to it because there's nothing else that you can see. You can't see the wall around it when you're looking at it. it, it totally subsumes your vision. Um, the other thing about this painting is that, again, when I talked at the beginning of this lecture about the way that reproductions um, blow out contrasts in, in images. So the camera is creating more contrast than there actually is if you see this thing in person. So you can see that there is this um, pyramid shape and a couple of books on the nightstand, and they have a bit of contrast to them. In person, it, it doesn't even look like this. It's, it's harder to distinguish what everything is in person. Um, so the contrast is reduced even more um, when you see this, again, in, in person. So what that does is, again, it does a couple of things. Your, your periphery is filled. With, with this painting and you can't see anything else. And it takes your eyes some time to adjust to it. Um, it. Takes maybe two or three minutes to really be able to see what's going on because your retinas are really, really sensitive little things. Um, and they have, they have to adjust to things. I'm sure that you've woken up in the middle of the night, taken a look at your phone, your phone blinds you, right? Um, because your retina was not ready to see all of that light at once, and it hurts. Um, and so you're walking around, right, in a museum, very brightly lit area. You're used to this certain amount of light, and you come to this, and it takes time to adjust to it. So say that it takes two or three minutes to adjust to this painting. Now that's time that's, that's designed to slow you down, to take, to force you to take the time to pay attention to this. Kerry James Marshall has affected you psychologically. He has forced you to pay attention to this image. And as it unfolds, you start to see the different things in the image, in the painting, and you start to be able to read, for example, the title of the book on the bookshelf. And you can understand better what this painting is so through the use of this minor key, Marshall has set up a situation that forces you to pay attention and to engage in this work of art so that you are affected by it. And then when you read the description of the image, the title and, and what it's a painting of, right, then you have a different sort of, again, psychological effect um, response to the painting again. So, very somber painting using a minor value key. It's appropriate, it's a somber sort of key to use. So we've talked about 
major value keys and how those can exist in the low, middle, and, and high uh, spectrum of the, the value scale. And the same thing for minor keys and how major keys are, there's a more contrast, there is um, a sense of liveliness to it, and minor value keys force you into a more somber, slow read of the image here. So this is what design is. Okay, so let's look at, and there is the desaturated version of it as well. Let's look at one more example of a low minor value key. This one by Louise Nevelson here. Um, she's a sculptor. These are found objects um, combined into these sculptures, which are read actually in a two-dimensional way. There's not much from these sculptures that you'll get by looking at the side of them, and they're always up against a wall, so you can't experience them in the round. Um, so they are meant to be viewed from the front here. Um, and there is a lot of repetition of shapes, uh, different sorts of contrast of shapes that go on in here. So there's a lot of good design elements going on in here. But she'll also take her paint, her sculptures and paint them all a uniform color to unify it all together through tone. Um, and this one exists in a low minor value key because all of the tone is black. There is, right, there's where the light hits the paint and there's where shadows are cast. So there's a bit of a variance there, but there's no light light. So here we have another example of a low minor value key, uh, this time with the sculpture though. So let's take a look at your homework. I want you to read The Art of Color and Design by Maitland Graves, uh, the PDF that's available in your files folder on Canvas, the value chapter. Um, studio problem number 27, I want you to do golden mean format divisions. So give me that one by 1 1.618 uh, format 120 times, and you're doing the same thing you've done with the squares and the five by sevens, two perpendicular lines meeting at a T. Studio problem number 28, create a nine step value scale. You can use the color aid packet, which was in, actually I, I said last time that it was in the required materials. It is in the suggested materials, but it's a heavily suggested item. Um, you can use paint chips or you can do this on a computer. I mean, we're doing this virtually anyway. Um, you can do this part on a computer if you so desire. So even that means that, you know, you can just look up a value scale and print it out. But I do want this to be in your book. Um, and that's, that's the difference. We looked at a nine step value scale at the beginning of this lecture. So you should know what it looks like. And studio problem number 29, create a gradient value scale. But I also want you to have an inverse value scale to set inside it. And I'm gonna show you what I mean here. So studio problem number 28, the nine step value scale, you got it. Create one of these, mount it on a piece of construction paper and put it in your book. Easy peasy. Now this is a little bit more difficult. So this is a gradient value scale. It moves seamlessly from value to value. Um, and I want you to create one of these. You can use paint, you can use um, torn up bits of newspaper. Um, that's actually a, a really good project to do with torn up bits of newspaper. Um, you can do, you can use really whatever you want. You can, again, even print this out on your computer. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that I want you to take and create an inverse of this value scale to set inside it. So let me show you what I mean. I want you to have another piece of paper printed out that you can take and set on top of this thing, just like that. Now, I don't want you to glue this piece of paper down because that would defeat the purpose of being able to use it, right? Your sketchbook that you're creating should be a reference book for you of thinking about what design is, what visual communication is, and how to use it. It's something that you can go back and reference in years to come. I still actually use my design one and two sketchbooks. I look at them from time to time. So I'm not just saying this like, oh yeah, you'll use it. Like, I mean, if, if you're serious about this stuff, you will look back at it. But having this extra inverse value scale here now allows you to do a couple of things because you can move it around within this value scale that you will have 
to, um, paste it down in your sketchbook. The larger value scale you should paste down in your sketchbook, but this thinner strip that's an inverse, you can take and you can move it around. So <clears throat> essentially now what I'm looking at is um, a compressed value scale on the left-hand side from very light light, uh, from my whitest white to into middle dark gray there. But I'm not looking at the darkest darks, the blackest blacks all the way on the right. And I can see the way that within this world that the middle dark section on the left side of my inverse slip contrasts very heavily against my whitest white. And I can see that that contrast might be enough of the contrast that I need, that I don't actually need to place white against black to get this ultra contrast. Um, that there's contrast to be had already, and I can move it in then the opposite direction and see a similar effect going on here. You'll also notice where somewhere along in the center of this, there is a gray section where the difference between vanishes. The difference between the inverse value scale and the value scale vanishes, and there is light that moves across the surface. These are things to think about when you're designing um, an image that uses value heavily. And so take this extra slip of paper, you can create a pocket on the, uh, on the page that you're pasting studio problem number 29 in, uh, cut out another sheet of paper, um, create a small pocket that you can kind of slide this inverse value scale into and out of, so you can take it out and use it and put it back in the pocket so you don't lose it. Um, but I want it to remain removable here like that. So that's it. Very um, kind of brief introduction into the idea of value scales, major and minor, um, and how they operate in images to create different sorts of feelings. If you have any questions, let me know.